connection. Um, and okay, we are recording now. And I am open to answering questions as we go through. So I should be able to see the chat the way I have everything set up. But if I miss something and, and you see it, Priscilla, feel free to, to jump in. Um, so my talk today is called Towards a Regional Public Health Approach to Antimicrobial Resistance and Stewardship. And I'm really excited to be here today. And here's a brief roadmap of where we'll be going. I'm going to give a, a brief background, um, just kind of, of um, just a, a minute or two of like kind of my background and how I ended up here in academics. I have spent a lot of time in public health, so that's why I'm really excited to present here today. And as some of you know, I can't keep myself away from CDC or out of health departments. So I've been in and out of Pima County and Yuma County health departments getting involved in various projects. Um, but you know, really a topic that's near and dear to me is antibiotic resistance and stewardship. I've been pulled away you know, with COVID as I know everybody on this call has and really looking to, to come back in this, um, not post COVID, but um, you know, kind of in, the, in this different space that we find ourselves in and, and COVID is definitely relevant to this topic as well. So I'm gonna talk a bit about surveillance, some challenges and solutions to resistance um, uh, some of the research that I think has been really most pivotal to date and where I'm trying to go with my lab and some next steps for engagement of um, public health. So that's where I'm going. Any one of these topics I feel like at the bottom could be a talk in and of itself. So I'm seeing this as really kind of a, a 30, 30,000 foot view. But so just a little bit about me for those of you who don't know me. I'm originally from a very rural town in Northern California. So I I went to Los Angeles for college to, to get a totally different experience. Um, was at UCLA for my bachelor's in neuroscience. It's called psychobiology. Um, and then I went on to, um, I worked in HIV for a while in Los Angeles and then went on to get a degree in a PhD in epidemiology and public health from Yale. And then I went straight into the Epidemic Intelligence Service or EIS um, program down at CDC. So I know you at Pima County have your first EIS officer, which is super exciting, Cedar. Um, I was placed in Atlanta at Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion, so we did a lot of work with healthcare-associated infections and antimicrobial resistance, um, and it was really my sort of introduction to the type of public work, public health work that, that you all do, um, investigated some dialysis deaths um, in uh, the mid-Atlantic region. I went to um, Uganda for an Ebola outbreak, spent some time in East Africa working in resource-limited settings with infection prevention in hospitals and did a lot of data analysis related to antimicrobial resistance. And then I, I continued in public health for another five years at CDC after the EIS fellowship, um, working also in, in um, HAIs, transplant and transfusion safety and antibiotic resistance, and then moved out to Oregon where I did just basic, you know, overall, I worked in HAI and AR primarily, but also did, um, you know, everything else, as you know, at a health department, uh, in acute and communicable disease, we, we you know, every epidemiologist is sort of on call for, for everything. So then I moved here to U of A, um, and so I'm in my home department is epidemiology and biostatistics. They have a cross appointment over at the School of Medicine and Infectious Diseases, um, and I'm going to talk a bit about my research going forward. Um, I also teach some classes, One Health, Infections and Epidemics, Border Health, um, and um, I'm actually developing a course this summer in infection prevention and healthcare epi, and I'm really excited to talk to folks about the health department, how we can work together to get students and people from the health department some experiential learning experience. That would be a win-win for a win-win-win health department uh, for the facilities themselves, like long-term care that desperately needs, uh, you know, in-person assistance from public health um, and uh, for our students and for public health and for those facilities. So, all right. So enough about me, I'm going to switch gears to um, sort of the history and mechanisms of antibiotic resistance. And so any talk that I give, I always like to start with um, giving credit to the bacteria themselves. So we tend to think of resistance as it relates to human medicine, which of course that's, that's the era we're in and that, that's our field. But these bacteria in terms of like the amount of time that the earth has been in existence, um, you can see that kind of the first modern human, uh, you know, if we look at it in terms of a clock arrived, you know, around 1159 and 59.9 seconds, but the first bacteria really were, you know, around um, much, much earlier. So bacteria have been around for 3.5 billion years. They've been diversifying, competing for scarce resources. And so in nature, 
antibiotic resistance mechanisms evolve. If you're a bacteria and you're competing with res for resources with another bacteria, that bacteria is going to evolve mechanisms to kill you, and you are going to evolve mechanisms to evade them. And so this kind of evolution has been happening for billions of years. You know, by contrast, humans, we've been around for a couple hundred thousand years. Um, you know, civilization is even more recent. And then our kind of use of antibiotics in medicine and factory farming is even more recent. So while we're new to this problem, the, the bacteria definitely have a leg up. And so these types of mechanisms that they develop can take many forms. So one kind of common form, if you're a you know, single celled bacteria, um, would be to have a, you know, a more robust cell wall so that antibiotics or other organisms that are trying to, to kill you cannot penetrate that cell wall. Um, there's creative mechanisms like pumps that will take in the antibiotic and pump it right back out. There's enzymes that can inactivate the antibiotic, et cetera. So many, many different ways in which bacteria can evolve resistance. And then of course, what happens is once an organism has resistance, um, once there's antimicrobial pressure uh, that's applied, which can be something that happens in nature from another microbe or our use of targeted use of antibiotics to kill a particular bacteria, um, those that happen to have a resistance mechanism. So in this case, here's a bacteria uh, you know, the green ones are susceptible to this antimicrobial pressure and the orange ones are not. So what happens? The orange ones proliferate and now we have more antibiotic resistant bacteria, which can then be spread person to person. And so that we call horizontal transmission kind of human to human, person to person. But of course, this can happen in a zoonotic context as well, where the bacteria can be transmitted, uh, resistant bacteria from animals to humans and vice versa. There's also a lot of resi resistance mechanisms in the environment, which we know why now, because they've been evolving for all these millions of years. And I'll get into that a bit later when I talk about some of um, the research that I'm interested in. So kind of fast forwarding up to kind of recent human history in 1928, there was the discovery of penicillin. You all know this story. And the 40s and 60s became the sort of golden age of, of antibiotic discovery. So once penicillin was discovered, um, a, this was sort of revolutionary, additional antibiotics were discovered, um, but then after the 1960s, production of antibiotics slowed down immensely, and I'll, I'll talk about why in a few slides, but um, overall, this was just seen as, you know, a complete miracle, um, and the deaths in the United States due to infectious diseases just plummeted, and um, there's, there's a lot to this story, including better infrastructure, indoor plumbing, et cetera. But antibiotics are a really big part of that story of how we moved from an era where infectious diseases were um, you know, a huge um, cause of mortality to where they became a relatively rare cause of mortality um, infection. Um, and so there were some early concerns about antibiotic overuse. So this is, you know, at the time Alexander Fleming received the Nobel Prize for discovery of penicillin and said that, you know, there a time may come when penicillin can be bought by anyone in shops and there's this danger um, that, you know, man might overdose himself by exposing his microbes to non-lethal quantities of the drug and make them resistant. This is one mechanism by which resistance can evolve, uh, incomplete taking up a course. But certainly there were many... There are many ways that resistance can evolve and, and um, spread, but there was this sort of early warning. And so in the, you know, between the 1960s sort of gold, golden age of discovery and current day, we've seen not only have antibiotics saved people from an infection that would have been previously lethal, but they've also revolutionized the way that medicine is practiced. So advances in chemotherapy, surgery, and transplants, these are all procedures that would never be done if we couldn't rely on antibiotics to account for the fact that chemotherapy intentionally suppresses the immune system. Surgery intentionally you know, breaks barriers that protect from infection. And of course, transplants, um, those patients are incredibly susceptible to infection. Uh, but antibiotics ha have sort of provided this layer of protection. Um, and so while they're used in those sort of cases of extreme medical intervention, we also all know that antibiotics are used all throughout medicine in outpatient urgent care, emergency care, and even just in the community. And we sort of evolved this uh, habit of prescribing or seeking out antibiotics just in case. And so antibiotics have been deeply enculturated both in healthcare and as we'll talk about later in our communities as well. 
Um, and so bacteria, how have they responded to this massive influx of, of antibiotics? Well, the back, like I said, they've, they've got resistance mechanisms that have been around for a long time, and we're seeing those mechanisms amplified when we look at the types of infections that we see in our patient populations. Um, so what are the consequences of this sort of raise, you know, increases in antibiotic resistance? I'm, I talk a lot about antibiotic resistance, but the same phenomenon um, is also occurring um, in with antiviral medication, antiparasitic medications as, such as antimalarials, et cetera. And so um, you know, this was a study done, uh, published in 2016 by some economists um, out of a, a group in England. And so they were looking, this is kind of a complicated chart to understand, but if you look at the light blue um, shading, that indicates the sort of total mortality worldwide from these various causes, cancer, cholera, diabetes, et cetera, um, in 2016. And this purple, this is kind of our total global deaths from uh, drug resistance in 2016. But if nothing were done, kind of like when we talk about climate change, if we do nothing, what's the worst case scenario? Scenario, If nothing's done to sort of stop this evolution of drug resistance, we could see deaths globally from um, antimicrobial resistance surpass deaths from cancer by the year 2050. Um, and one thing that's important to note is that this is, there's, tremendous amplification of resistance in healthcare settings. And some of this is because, okay, healthcare settings, there's a lot of, you know, people who are immunocompromised, the potential for this sort of, uh, you know, um, taking hold or evolu evolution of a more resistant mechanism, but really there's a lot of human to human transmission in these settings where people are, you know, essentially cohabitating in, you know, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, admissions to acute care hospitals, et cetera. Um, and, and this is, we, we actually see this play out in outbreaks that I'm sure some of you have been a part of where you see it bounce from setting to setting. Um, so I wanna talk quickly or sort of at a high level about um, surveillance. How do we know how much antimicrobial resistance is out there? Um, one way is that we have, th this slide is actually um, on healthcare associated infections um, and one way that we can track resistance is by utilizing our surveillance systems that are used to track infections that occur in healthcare settings. Um, there are sort of a suite of infections that are reported as, as a condition of CMS participation. So translation, like any hospital that's receiving CMS reimbursement, which is all of them, um, with more than 25 patient beds has to report ventilator associated infections, uh, methicillin resistant staff, bloodstream infections, central line associated bloodstream infections, catheter associated UTIs, um, and a couple of others depending on the state. And so because these infections are reported, um, with when they're reported, um, the actual pathogen that caused the infection needs to be reported as well. So that's one way we can kind of see, we can gauge how much resistance is happening. The other point of me showing this slide is just um, that healthcare associated infections, we've made major progress over the past couple of decades nationwide in terms of understanding what needs to be done in terms of infection prevention in hospitals to prevent spreading infections in hospitals. And that all got worse with COVID. And there's a lot of reasons why this happened that I think you can, you can easily imagine just the pressure on the healthcare system, the short staffing, the lack of PPE, et cetera, caused a spread of these infections. Um, and by extension, a spread of antimicrobial resistant infections as well. And so this is a report that actually was published in June of this year. Um, this was following the, the last kind of urgent threat report that CDC published in 2019 on antimicrobial resistance. And this 2022 kind of update just showed an increase in all of these antimicrobial resistant infections that are tracked in hospitals. Um, so a 15% increase in um, antimicrobial resistant infections tracked in, in hospitals um, since sort of the start of COVID. Um, and um, yeah, and then sort of just there's there's delayed data that's available. Um, there's kind of, so there were, there were issues. We know that objectively speaking, resistant increase, but we also know that there's sort of um, under measurement during this, this period. I and mean, these are sort of some of the, out of the available data that we did have, some of the heavy hitters that you hear about. Um, carbapenem resistant acinetobacter, um, that has just been taking off worldwide. WHO is very concerned about this bug. Um, acinetobacter loves to live on surfaces and it's just highly prevalent in many hospitals. So to see it resistant to carbapenem, which is 
like a third generation antibiotic. So kind of one that, that we're really trying to protect is pretty alarming. Um, we've seen increases in antifungal resistant Canada auris. Um, CRE or carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae increases in that. That's kind of the one that's been dubbed the nightmare bacteria. So across the board, gram negative, some of the gram positives down here, we're seeing increases in resistance. Um, and so, you know, the, the NHSN, which is that, that surveillance network that collects information on HAIs, um, one of the things I'm just planting the seed for later, I know I've talked um, with folks at Pima County too about being able to access that NHSN data. The state accesses it and follows it, but that's something that certainly Pima County um, has access to. If someone is willing to go through the process to get access to that data, that's something you could look at. Um, and we can see that um, there's also additional modules in that reporting mechanism for reporting antibiotic use. And so there's an increasing number of hospitals that are not only reporting infections, but they're reporting on antibiotic use in their facilities. And I think this is really critical. Um, but we can see we have a long way to go. So in Arizona, there's only 10% of um, hospitals um, as, a, in, as of 2020 that were reporting how much antibiotics they use in their in their hospitals. So this is um, there's just a lot of a lot of ground to make up. And so we really need enhanced surveillance for uh, for healthcare associated infections, but also antimicrobial resistance. So globally. Um, WHO has a system for extracting clinical microbiology data. I'll talk a bit about that later with some of my work. Um, so that's um, that's happening nationally. I think we can build upon this NHSN network to get more data on how many, how much, and when we're using antibiotics, um, and creating sort of local profiles of um, antibiotic resistance patterns um, is actually very important just for to raise awareness, but also. To make local providers of uh, you know uh, aware that certain antibiotics are not uh, don't work or are resistant. Now I'll I'll show you an example in a bit, but just kind of at a high level, um, there are you know local and state labs. You know here in Arizona, um, uh, there's the TGen Laboratory, which I know collaborates a lot with both county and state health departments, where they receive certain specimens and they can do very detailed typing to figure out what kind of resistance is out there. Um, so even in, in specimens that aren't submitted through hospitals. Um, this is one way we can get at, um, at resistance. Um, there's sort of national and regional lab networks. So um, we have a regional lab that um, if there's a you know, highly resistant pathogen, um, for example, in one of our long-term care facilities in Pima County, um, there was some acinetobacter that had a very highly resistant profile, and it was sent to the regional lab just to assess for pan resistance, which wasn't pan resistant, but that means it's resistant to everything, which is worst case scenario. There's nothing you can you can treat this with, but we do have access to kind of this national um, network of regional labs through the AR, ARLN. Um, and then there's uh, the Global Health Security Agenda, which funds uh, labs across the world, basically, uh, to start to track um, antimicrobial resistance. So those are more few and far between, but I would argue that it would it's very important for us to think about how we would invest globally. Um, and this is just sort of the, the image at the top here kind of shows the, the various places in which antimicrobial resistance um, can manifest itself and sort of also pro proliferate. And so we need to kind of be thinking about healthcare. Okay, we've got our surveillance systems. We know doctors prescribe in healthcare. There are things we can do. The community, there's been sort of less research on how people use antibiotics in the community, how they seek them, how it spreads in the community, and then the environment. Um, we know there's a ton of antimicrobial resistance in terms of the, the bugs that live in the soil, the bacteria in our soil. There's all kinds of resistance there, and we don't yet fully understand as a scientific community how that impacts human health. Um, and what to do about it. We can't sterilize the soil, but um, we are trying to think in terms of a one health approach to this. Like, what can we what can we learn about about the the bugs in our environment and and where they pop up um, to cause human health problems? Um, and so there's there's been sort of national and international calls for use of less antibiotics in agriculture. So um, as many of you know vast majority of antibiotics used in the U.S. are used in factory farming, and there have been various um, efforts to, to stop that. So WHO recommends halting of antibiotics on any healthy animals. We did have a farm bill passed by the USDA, um, which uh, said that 
you know, animals should not be receiving antibiotics just for protection unless they're sick. They need, and there needs to be a veterinary context to this. Um, and so there's efforts to do that. There's also the National Animal Health Monitoring System, which has really only in recent years um, uh, been, I think, really robustly funded. And so they're starting to look at things like um, animal illnesses in feedlots and typing some of the, the organisms that are associated with, with illnesses on feedlots and also more um, explicitly tracking antibiotic use, which is which is very poorly tracked dis despite the, the, the rules against, um, against prophylactic prescribing. There's a lot that happens anyway. Um, okay, so challenges and solutions. I think I'm gonna just stop. If, does anybody have any questions? Um, or comments before I kind of um, talk about some of the important challenges and solutions. Hey, I was wondering if you could, you mentioned One Health briefly. So just for any folks who don't have a background on One Health, if you could just give a little bit of a background on that. Sure. Yeah. So um, thank you for that, Priscilla. So yeah, One Health is sort of this, um, it's, it's an approach to public health and to science that considers the role of human, animal, and environmental health simultaneously. And it's really a, a discipline that has emerged from our being so siloed. In fact, you know, for example, um, when I worked at CDC, we while I was there, we, we opened an office of, of One Health. And, and it was because at CDC, we're so good at, or we were so good at tracking human clinical disease. Like that's what we were good at. But if there was some kind of zoonotic infection, it would be really hard to collaborate across the board with with uh, animal health folks and same, you know, we've got uh, USDA, which is siloed from EPA, et cetera. So One Health is this sort of idea that we're always, uh, it's, we need to be talking across disciplines, we need to be collaborating, um, and that there are so many questions that are important that, that need to be answered about the connection between these three um, communities, basically. Um, so you'll hear a lot about a One Health approach later. There's, there's been a lot of state money going towards that where we started new programs here at U of A. We're trying to work more closely with like our, our new vet school and our ag extension, um, our environmental folks, et cetera. Um, so I'm gonna talk a few, uh, about some of the major challenges and solutions in, in this field. So um, one of the major challenges has been this lack of investment in antibiotic development. Um, and if you think about it, it really makes sense because because the way that new drugs are developed is from venture capital and investment in research and development. And so if you're a venture capitalist, um, you know, are you going to invest in a drug that actually starts working? The more you use it, the less effective it is. That's the case with antibiotics. As we use more of them, resistance develops and they, they're less effective. Um, and so it's a, it's a really crappy deal for venture capitalists. Um, and so they're going to invest in things that are going to work just as well 30 years from now as they work now. So we're talking about uh, drugs that address chronic disease, uh, lifestyle, everything like that. Those, those are like the money makers, but not antibiotics. Um, and so this has been kind of a, a really huge challenge for years. We've seen the shutdown of um, antibiotic R&D, um, entire wings at some of our largest pharmaceutical companies in the US. Um, and so, um, so there's actually one of the solutions recently has been there's this CARBEX Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria Initiative, um, which is an international coalition of, of agencies that have, you know, gotten together, uh, procured funding and tried to, you know, strengthen the pipeline for new products. So they've invested, you know, $396 million dollars. Um, it, trying to develop, you know, new antibiotics and to bring them to, to trial, et cetera, those huge financial barriers that are there for any new drug development. And this coalition is dedicated to overcoming these barriers. So they've, they've made some progress, but there's a lot more that needs to be done considering the speed at which some of our antibiotics are becoming resistant. Um, rapid diagnostics are also um, a huge, our lack of rapid diagnostics is a, is a challenge, right? I know all of us recently have wished we had like, you know, rapid diagnostic at home that would tell us if we had COVID, RSV, flu, para, influenza, et cetera. That would be beautiful because then we would know what we had uh, and we could take action accordingly. Um, in the world of antibiotic, you know, resistance, we know that overprescribing is such a huge driver of resistance. And 
many people are prescribed or actively seek out antibiotics for viral infections. So the more, if, if we can get a rapid diagnosis quickly um, and it can lead to better treatment and less, um, less overuse of antibiotics for conditions that are not bacterial, right? Um, so the classic example is taking, you know, antibiotics for flu, COVID, RSV, antibiotics are not going to do anything uh, to, to um, stop the replication of that virus, but um, we take them anyway as a population. So um, investment in rapid diagnostics is one potential solution, and there is a lot of movement on that front. Um, I do some work over at the Valley Fever Center for Excellence, and we were working on a study looking at how often valley fever is misdiagnosed as bacterial pneumonia. So someone will come in with valley fever, acute pulmonary issues, prescribed antibiotics, they don't work. They're prescribed a broader spectrum of antibiotics. Those don't work. They're prescribed broader spectrum of antibiotics. And each time those are our more protected antibiotics that they're getting. All the while they have a fungal infection that is, you know, isn't touched by antibiotics. And so what we've tried to do is characterize the number of times that happens, the amount of inappropriate antibiotic prescribing, and we've also done some work with companies that are developing rapid diagnostics to um, so that a patient showing up in the ER would know right away if they had valley fever versus bacterial pneumonia. Those aren't, they're not quite, uh, they're not the greatest. They don't have the greatest sensitivity specificity, but those are the type of efforts that I think can really move the needle in terms of overuse. The same logic applies to vaccination. If fewer people are getting COVID, RSV, and flu, there are fewer people with respiratory symptoms that are going to seek out antibiotics to cure that viral infection. Um, and so there have been a bunch of studies that kind of show that, you know, this, this has actually uh, decreased use. So even the, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine um, in kids, there's been some modeling studies that show that could drastically reduce um, antibiotic use because it prevents bacterial infection, but also I think all of the vaccines against viruses um, will help as well. Um, and so this, this basically just shows um, the antibiotic prescriptions dispensed per thousand persons in the U.S. in 2014. This is from a huge like insurance database where um, the, these researchers, again, this is an old study now, but they really just show that, you know, there's higher antibi antibiotic prescribing at the poles of life, like when you're when you're little and getting all respiratory infections because you haven't developed your, you know, your immune system is still in progress or um, older adults whose immune system is declining. So we see much, much, many more prescriptions in these age categories as we would expect. But just the overall five prescriptions for every six people uh, per year in the US is really high. And it's just notable to compare it to other countries that have very strict uh, protocols for antibiotic prescribing, that there's far fewer, for example, in Sweden, um, you know, far fewer uh, prescriptions per thousand people in the population. Um, and so all of this results in about 40 million people who are given antibiotic for respiratory illnesses annually in the U.S., and about 27 million of those people are getting antibiotics unnecessarily. And this is actually, this is pre-COVID, um, and we know that this has actually gotten worse with, with COVID. So a lot of, lot of issues to work with. So antimicrobial stewardship, this whole concept is like, let's make sure that we are using antibiotics. We're, we're being smart about it. So there's this little owl with glasses and he's supposed to be, you know, representing us being smart. So knowing when they work um, and it's really kind of, you know, prescribed the right antibiotic, you know, at the right time for the right length. Um, and there's been a lot of resources put into um, training healthcare providers. So physicians, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, those that really influence, um, influence how how much um, and how and how often antibiotics are prescribed where there's been less work and where I would like to move um, some of my work is towards understanding off prescription use of antibiotics we all know that you can go to a flea market and buy antibiotics you can go cross the border and get them very easily so I'm kind of trying to understand how we can develop stewardship programs that kind of empowers uh not necessarily providers, but people who are, you know, who want to maintain their health um, with, with kind of the information they need and um, to, to be smart about antibiotics, um, keep themselves and their, and their family healthy. And I wanted to finish because this is a challenge that, um, that I've addressed slightly in my lab with some preliminary work, but hope to work on more really understanding antibiotic use in the U.S.-Mexico border region. And so it kind of bears, um, it's important to understand kind of the context in Mexico. 
So, you know, the, the research is really, really poor in the United States and throughout, you know, the Americas on, you know, antibiotic resistance in the community. But we know from the few studies that are out there that there is a lot of antibiotic resistance in healthcare settings and in the few community studies like throughout Latin America. Um, and um, antibiotics really became in, they were just an industry, right? They're very profitable, sold in pharmacies. And until 2010, you could buy antibiotics in Mexico without a prescription. Um, and in 2010, recognizing that this was potentially a problem because there was this huge profit motive to market antibiotics and to sell them and to take them because of some misinformation or just incomplete understanding of their use. Um, in 2010, Mexico passed a law saying, oh, you got to have a prescription. Um, but that just because the law was passed doesn't mean the economic incentives went away. So many pharmacies opposed the law. And what happened and what you'll see now um, in, in many pharmacies in Mexico is that there'll be a little consultado, which is essentially a physician's office or a room kind of off the wing of a pharmacy where you can go and very cheaply get, uh, you know, for, for uh, $3 US, you could get a prescription for antibiotics and then take it right to the pharmacy. You're in the same building and get your prescription filled. So there's workarounds that, and those are, those are very, very common. Um, and so it's also very popular to, you know, when healthcare access is compromised um, or when people don't trust the healthcare system, you can imagine that, you know, it, it, it's, you're taking agency, you're taking care of your own health, you're going and doing something for yourself. So in many ways, it's a logical decision to go and seek out treatment from a pharmacy. And so this is kind of, this is just setting the stage for where we are um, in terms of the, and, and despite this law in 2010, there's still many pharmacies on the U.S.-Mexico border, um, and you'll, you'll see this just if you go across the border anytime. Um, so I want to talk a bit about some of the research um, that, that's going on in this field. Um, I, let, I'm going to go back to healthcare for a second, because this is one of the, the, um, the best designed um, study of antibiotic stewardship in a healthcare setting that I've seen, and this one was published, I think, in 2014 in JAMA. But this was basically an intervention where uh, there was this recognition that among all of these pediatric outpatient practices in Boston, there was tons of overprescribing. Kids would come in with viral illnesses and the physician sends them away with, with a prescription. Um, and we can all understand why this might happen, right? There's like patient satisfaction is a major part of physician reimbursement. Uh, sometimes parents come in expecting to get antibiotics. Uh, but basically this, pro this program basically, they said, okay, we're actually, we're gonna look at every um, you know, all the lab results that come back from these kids, and we're going to provide physicians with information about whether or not they prescribed appropriately and the percentage of time in which they prescribed an antibiotic appropriately. Um, and I think they, they kept it simple. It was just an email um, coming every couple of weeks that would either say you are a top performer, meaning they're in the top 10 percent or of like appropriate prescribing, or you are not a top performer. And this during the intervention, you can see that there's a control group. Um, and you can see the intervention group, they really started prescribing fewer antibiotics while this intervention was in place. But I think critically, the, the researchers continued to look at trends after they had removed that intervention and they started to creep back up. So I think the bottom line here is that this is really a, a tricky issue and requires, um, yeah, requires a lot of uh, attention to, um, for us to, it, it requires sort of this sort of dur durable Kind of interventions. Um, and so I'm going to get through this. I know I've, is Priscilla five minutes okay? At 1245? Okay. Um, another uh, really one of, I, I think, a, a woman who's done amazing work in this field is Dr. Julia Simzak. She's at, at Penn and she's really, she's a sociologist that has really delved into the social determinants of prescribing in healthcare settings. She talks a lot about the pressures, the competing priorities of physicians, the, the desire to do something for this individual patient. Um, overriding kind of these larger community factors in terms of resistance. Um, there's sort of this risk and fear, you know, our, our healthcare system is very litigious. There's always the fear of the worst case scenario, which is in many cases missing an infection. And this sort of like psychological pull of like the social relationships, the face-to-face -face interaction, which is stronger than the, the push of guidelines or restrictive policies. Um, so you can see that with parents and, and maybe a more Western setting. Um, you know, if you go to places like where, where I've worked in some of the outpatient facilities or hospitals in East Africa, 
Um, many of these people have walked for hours or even days to see a physician. And so the idea that you might miss an infection, not, not give them something when they're walking away is, is even is amplified even more in, in settings like this, uh, where a physician might just want to, let me, let me just give this, this med medicine just in case you have a bacterial infection. Um, and some of the work my students have been doing, um, there are a couple of my master's students that we really, um, pre-COVID, we were working in some of our nursing homes to understand antimicrobial prescribing. We uh, had this grant to go in and do an intervention. Uh, in early 2020, of course, got totally derailed by COVID, but some of the facilities that we've worked with were really concerned about prescribing, uh, over-prescribing during COVID, and they let us go uh, basically do an electronic medical record abstraction. So these two have abstracted thousands of records looking at um, patients with suspect infections and whether they were prescribed appropriately. Um, and so because we know nursing homes, uh, over 70% historically um, of, of residents who are prescribed or receive more than one per year, and there's huge amounts of overprescribing. So this, we're, we're still actually finishing this up, but you can kind of just see overall, the overall, the, the height of the bars reflects the amount of antibiotic prescribing and the purple sections are inappropriate prescribing. Um, and so we're looking at kind of uh, looking at that over time and, and drivers of inappropriate prescribing in the setting. So it's still an area I'm very interested in because nursing homes are sort of a, a perfect storm of vulnerable residents, congregate setting, and uh, and prescribers who are most often off-site. So they have very they don't have as much information as providers would in, in like a hospital setting. Um, one of my like best qualitative researchers um, got in there right before COVID and did 55 interviews with um, individuals in nursing homes. So we kind of went all over, um, you know, Southern Arizona. We kind of, we wanted to sample some uh, border facilities and rural facilities. Um, and we asked people from the medical director all the way down to um, the bedside provider, the people who write up on that, you know, uh, with front lines with the provider. Uh, we talked with housekeepers. I'm really trying to understand their, their understanding of, of antibiotic use in the settings and, um, you know, some themes that emerge. One major theme was interfacility communication being so bad. So residents would be, are often transferred from hospitals with incomplete information about their infection status or their prescribing status. Um, we uncovered some really interesting, um, interesting um, data from this study, which, which we're, we're writing up right now. Um, a lot about enculturated norms, um, a lot about um, how, just sort of how, how it goes down. The person at the bedside probably has the most knowledge of the patient condition, but there's not that communication up to the person who prescribes. So um, another, um, some other work we're doing on the U.S.-Mexico border, and I'm going to wrap this up pretty soon, but um, these two really helped out. Uh, we, ha we had a team of individuals who helped put together a survey to look at antibiotic use on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we worked a lot with partners down at Unison and Hermosillo to put together this survey, um, and we basically deployed it over Amazon Turk, but then we also did some in-person um, recruiting in the border region. Um, and we, when we asked people about their antibiotic use over the past three years, among people who had used an oral or injectable antibiotic, so not just the stuff, you know, you might buy like topical over the counter, but 48% had either purchased it uh, in kind of a setting that was a, a non-prescription antibiotic. So, you know, like at a flea market or um, without even a prescription at all, um, or borrowed it from a friend or family member, which was really high. And we looked at correlates of kind of using non-prescription antibiotic, and um, Brooke Hawks was very interested in whether um, healthcare system distrust was associated with it. And it, and it was, there were very strong findings, healthcare system distrust, even when we control for things like antibiotic knowledge, et cetera, was highly correlated. Um, we also had some interesting race ethnicity findings too that, that really underscored the fact that we need some community-based antimicrobial stewardship that is considerate of context um, in different communities. Um, some work I'm doing with um, a collaborator down at Unison Hermosillo. This is Enrique Boloto Martinez. He's a um, clinical microbiologist and runs the biochemistry department um, down there. And, and we're working on kind of developing these antibiograms, which is where you look at bug drug, drug interactions. So here are all the bugs on in the columns, or sorry, the rows, and here are all the drugs in the columns. And being able to, to pull data from multiple labs in a region and have a susceptibility profile, this is the type of thing that can really help raise awareness and, um, and inform prescriber uh, prescriber um, 
kind of decision making. So our goal is to really get this kind of data on both sides of the border. So pre-COVID, we were kind of running around to different uh, facilities on each side of the border and, and figuring out whether they would, you know, how they could share their data with us and how we could get it back to them. And so we're trying to revive these efforts in post-COVID. And finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, we talked about resistance in the environment. This is Jeannie McLean over in Environmental Sciences, and she and I um, did a little pilot study to look at resistance in the environment. We looked um, down in Nogales, kind of in an area that's known for these uh, raw sewage spills flowing north across the border. This is the, the wall down by Nogales. So and this is actually uh, along the river. This is actually toilet paper here. And here's our fearless uh, research assistant sampling the water. So we sampled in Nogales, Tubac, and up in Morena and kind of compared resistance levels in that the soil. And so the bottom line is we found that the further we got from the border, the lower the resistance levels were from the, the bugs that we were able to culture out of those samples. Not surprising, but again, it, it helps us set the foundation for like, what are how does this affect human and, and animal health and that's kind of where we're going with our next um, trying to write some grants moving forward so next steps i mean with with i know i've talked to a few people at pima and the state i would love to incorporate antibiotic resistance and stewardship into student curricula for the course i'm developing but also into professional development modules that i know uh, there's a lot of push to to develop infection prevention and antibiotic stewardship um, at local health departments. So I'm looking for ways to do that, to collaborate with you all. Um, encourage the use of that National Hospital Safety Network um, antibiotic use module for local facilities and for local public health to look at that data and to use that data um, to revive the binational efforts to track antimicrobial resistance in communities on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, and then I really do want to uh, focus my research moving forward on kind of the drivers of antibiotic seeking and use in, in this region. Um, to see how it could inform community-based antimicrobial stewardship. So these are lots of partners from the past, present, and hopefully future. Um, it really takes a village, and um, I'm always looking to, I'm always happy to talk about this topic and collaborate with folks. And so I'm going to wrap it up there um, so that we can, we can have a discussion. And I will stop sharing my screen. This is, if you want to contact me, this is my email, kellingson at arizona.edu. And you can learn more about some of our work on my website that we're always trying to update. It's always in an update state. So <laughs> that's it. Thank you so much for that, Kate. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like to bring forth? I was wondering if you could talk any more about how, um, so when we know there's these antibiotic resistance um, microbes in certain areas at higher rates, have we worked on developing any way of eliminating them from the environment short of reducing use and hoping that they kind of die off after a while or lose resistance or? Yeah, well, in, in terms of the environment, um, I don't think like all of my, you know, co collaborators over in soil sciences and stuff are like, yeah, you're, you're never going to sterilize the environment. This is this, you'll always find bacteria in the soil um, and it, where there's bacteria you'll find resistance so um, however I mean there definitely are efforts in um, in healthcare settings to make sure that you know where there's sort of a you know there's a high cost to someone getting affected with the with the antibiotic resistant organism to you know to keeping surfaces um, clean for healthcare workers to keep their hands clean but with actual with substances that don't promote resistance. So antibacterial soap, for example, that's not used. That is used in, in some hospitals, like in ICU and pre-surgery, there are definitely some anti antibiotics and antimicrobials in that scrub. But there's um, been a push towards not using antibacterial soap in community settings and even some healthcare settings where there's not high risk patient populations because that effort to keep the surface is clean itself is actually driving, can drive resistance. Um, the alcohol-based hand sanitizer um, is not, for the most part, associated with resistance. So that's why you'll see that everywhere. And also non-antimicrobial soap, because it uses physical friction rather than, um, you know, an antimicrobial to, to get the microbes off the skin. Um, but in terms of how we, like, in healthcare settings, I mean, the stewardship efforts really um, there are efforts to show these profiles like, hey, you know, almost all of the isolates coming from our hospital lab are resistant to this antibiotic. We need to, uh, you know, 
we need to actually like look at our prescribing and we need to use different antibiotics for the next person who gets it, but also look at, are we over prescribing a certain antibiotic? Can we scale back? So it's complicated, uh, but. Thank you. Kate, have we used um, any community health workers for the education of antibiotics? Is that something that's been explored yet? You know, I have, I think this would be, I would love to see um, community health workers incorporate sort of an educational module on that. Um, and I haven't found it, although our collaborator, Jill Dezepian, was telling us that she had was worked with one of the initial cohorts back in the 1980s of community health workers and said that this was an important issue to them back then. So I would love to revive it. And in some work that one of my other students has been working on that I didn't show he looked specifically at antibiotic use during COVID and found that there was um, th there were a, a lot of people in our sample that used antibiotics for because they were concerned about COVID. And so I'm wondering if there's room to incorporate in all of this community health work worker messaging about the importance of vaccination and educating about viruses that we could actually, can we slip antibiotic stewardship into some of those modules? Um, that would be. Cool. And I apologize. I think Daniel Castro might have had a question. I'm sorry. I, I saw your hand up and then went down. Hi. Yeah. Um, I'm new to the health department. Nice to meet you, Dr. Ellingson. Mm -hmm. um, as a practicing physician for 30 years, there's a perverse in incentive. I, I'm sure you're aware of this, but like about five years ago, CMS did new guidelines of coding, how we qualify how doctors click a box and decide what level is billed. And one of the criteria was prescription use. What that does, if you prescribe something, it moves it up, which means you get a lot more money. And I found that perverse that doctors, we were rewarded to prescribe more. I'm sure you've come across that, but it, you can see the layers to change this. You have to go all the way up to Medicare because incentives are not aligned. You know, I want to spend a lot of time talking about why you shouldn't use an antibiotic, but that's not the reward system. Just yeah. a comment. Oh, I really appreciate that. That is, I mean, I feel like across the board that there's perverse incentives for overprescribing all kinds of things besides, yeah, antibiotics with that. Um, but yeah, that that is, it, it also kind of sets the stage that there, yeah, there are bigger and policy issues at, at play here. And, you know, um, actually with my collaborators in Mexico, they made the comment that um, when, when they're looking at the resistance profiles in, in hospitals, I guess because of the way the healthcare system is structured and, and the incentive system is, is different, like when they came down and said, you have to you know, reduce prescribing for these specific antibiotics that we need, they're being totally overprescribed or third generation cephalosporins, for example, we need to like tamp that down. They just imposed restrictions on the formulary. And actually the, the resistance has gone down in some of those large medical centers in Hermosillo and Obregón where they looked at the compared time periods. Um, and they said, but, but yet in the community resistance was up. And so it was sort of interesting. And they're saying, you know, your healthcare system promotes it and, <laughs> and your, your rates are skyrocketing. And ours, we were able to kind of, because we, we had, there's more authority to, to make those kinds of rules. Um, anyway, it was interesting. Um, and you can, whatever you want to say about the healthcare system there being different or whatever, they, you know, there's, um, the profit motives are are different. So um, thank you for bringing that up. That's really, I always like hearing from people who have lived, lived that reality. So any closing questions for Dr. Ellingson today? I was wondering too if you had a chance at all to evaluate um, if consensus has changed much um, in kind of everyday citizens on the dangers of antibiotic resistance, especially when we're bombarded with like antibiotic soap and stuff. I wonder if kind of um, the general public kind of believes that, you know, this is just another one of those giant problems that'll be solved in the future and it's being blown out of control and we've lived with it so long and it's especially in a first world country like hear that it's something that we don't really have to worry about as much as maybe we should. If that's changed at all over time from like 10 years ago versus now versus, I don't know, 50 years ago, if we have any data on that. Um, 
I don't have great data on how much it's changed. I mean, certainly there's more awareness of antibiotic resistance, but um, I think, I guess one thing that um, was an important change was the um, FDA banning um, triclosan from certain, um, that's a type of antimicrobial, but of course the, the triclosan, there, there was sort of a consumer movement to remove that from a lot of our soaps because it was considered an antibacterial. Um, but again, I think that was, and, and that fine, that had been re removed from a lot of consumer products in Europe and many countries, but not the US until I think 2015. Um, and so there was part of that consumer movement included resistance, but it was mostly about that product being, you know, that product potentially having, um, you know, detrimental effects hormonally. Uh, so they took that antimicrobial out. But I think during all of those public conversations, there was a lot about like, why are we even putting antimicrobials in our consumer soaps, et cetera? Um, so I don't know, you know, that's one of the things I'm trying to get it with, that was one of the motivations for doing this survey in the border regions was to understand, um, you know, just broadly speaking, what is the level of knowledge and what is the level of, um, you know, knowledge and, and also kind of like how have people actually acted in the past three years in terms of seeking antibiotics. So um, it's a good question. I'd like to say that well, we know more as like a scientific community about it, but I don't know how much that's that's really penetrated to the public. And you're absolutely right that we're we're in this context where people have a lot to work, climate change, COVID. I mean, there's so much out there. I and I don't know where this where this falls on people's list of concerns. Um, Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you all. For, um, Sharon, I'm sorry, I apologize. I realized that you unmuted. Is there something you'd like to share? We have no further comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellingson, for being thank here you. with us and sharing your broad knowledge. Um, everybody have some happy holiday seasons and see you all next year. Be safe. Thank you all. Thank you.